are delighted to welcome you all to this webinar today. It is an absolute honor to be speaking with you all and to be opening the Menopause Hub. I wish to place on record my sincere thanks to Miss Loretta Dignam and her team at the Menopause Hub and the Irish Nurses and Midwives Organisation professional staff for all their hard work that went into ensuring a wonderful lineup for today. Being part of a predominantly female profession, I'm very proud to be raising the flag for the movement on menopause in the workplace. This is an area of women's health that I am so passionate about and the position statement from the INMO is a fantastic resource for the workplace. The research has shown that women were poorly prepared to deal with the onset of menopause in the workplace. Now, putting together the symptoms of menopause and other factors like caring roles and work demands, such as the daily wearing of PPE for nurses and midwives, have been more than challenging. I am so thankful to each and every nurse and midwife who contributed to the menopause survey, and we will hear more from this today. Opening up the conversation and breaking the taboo is what is needed, and I'm so delighted to be starting the topic of conversation, and I look forward to the panel discussion later on today. The menopause concerns us all. We will either be the ones transitioning through menopause, or we will be supporting our colleagues through this very difficult stage in life, and we need to be doing this better and better. That is a very real consequence in the lives of people in our society and every day. The INMO specifically want to change attitudes towards menopause in the workplace through education, policy development, and to normalize these discussions. The INMO recognize the importance of supporting women in the workplace, and we believe that the investment by healthcare employers is creating a healthy workplaces that are menopause friendly. This will be a con contributing factor in retaining nurses and midwives. And remember, employers have responsibility to raise awareness and provide support to women. As president of the Irish Nurses and Midwives Organisation, I want to lend my full support to the call for action. And I congratulate all of you for being part of this necessary discussion and the necessary change. And I commit to you our full support. So thank you for your attention. And it gives me great pleasure to open this webinar. And I hope you all enjoy today's events. Um, I'm going to start off this um, webinar um, today just to um, report on the results from the recent survey that's been conducted by the INMO on the experience of nurse of menopause, the experience of nurse and midwives uh, of menopause in the workplace. Um, this um, study was conducted over probably about a two week period and we've got a, an overwhelming response in terms of the, of, of the survey. So just to start off, just to say that the survey was, was uh, developed in collaboration with the uh, Menopause Hub, who are really thankful for their uh, support. And we've built a relationship with the Menopause Hub over the last three or four years, ever since we established our um, uh, guidelines and also our position statement in 2019. Just some background information. That I, I suppose if we look at the background information, there are nearly uh, 350,000 women employed in Ireland um, who are over the, uh, who are aged between 45 and 64. And that comes from the CSO uh, figures in 2016. And the average age of uh, women's menopause is 51 years. And that's according to uh, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence in, uh, in the UK. Um, so there's a significant number of women who will be working through uh, their menopause transition in the workplace. And I suppose it's to, uh, as a statement, I suppose uh, that we're all very much aware of is that the nursing and midwifery professions are predominantly female professions. So this is a real, uh, live and important issue for nurses and midwives. Um, also that women represent 90%, just to underline the fact, of NMBI registrants, and they span the full working uh, age group as well. And within the INMO, um, 5,000 of the INMO members are over the age of So this is an important issue for society, it's an important issue for nursing and midwifery, and it's an important issue for the INMO. The experiences of 
uh, the menopause can vary significantly. And that's one thing we need to recognize um, because not everybody's experience is the same. So that needs to be brought into consideration when we're developing any supports or policies in this area. Um, the health service executive uh, estimate that eight out of 10 women experience symptoms leading up to the menopause. Um, of these, 45% find their symptoms difficult to deal with. Um, and we'll, we'll address some of those issues in terms of the survey results. Uh, some women experience no symptoms. So again, it's just to underline that experiences are different, um, while others experience severe uh, symptoms of menopause. So just a bit about the Irish Health Service, four out of five employees in the Irish Health Service um, are women. Um, women are the majority in all grades, with the exception of medical and dental consultants. Um, women account for 92% um, and, uh, of nurses, 85% of managers and administrators, uh, administrators, 84% of other health and social care. So again, this is all just to underline, this is an important issue for individuals and it's an important issue for um, society and the Irish health system. That's why we carried out this service because we recognize it is an issue that needs to be um, investigated further. There needs to be more research and the profile needs to be raised in this area. This is the start of the process for us, um, building on the work that we've already carried out and established our position statement in 2019. And my role in this process is um, to report on the findings. Um, and I know later on, um, we will have speakers in the area talking about uh, menopause in more detail that relate more to the experience and symptoms as well. So as I mentioned earlier, this uh, survey was conducted over a two week period. Um, which ended on the 8th of October. So it was, it was sort of late September, early October. And we received um, a fantastic response, which underlines the importance of this issue. Um, probably no survey that we've carried out, but we received a response over such a short period of time to this extent. So again, to repeat that, that in itself is a finding in terms of the significance of this as a workplace issue for nurses and midwives. We carried out an online survey. Um, we looked at men menopause specific questions that relate to the workplace. Now, we weren't specifically looking at menopause symptoms, but more in terms of issues of concern in the workplace and um, members' experience. We also measured professional quality of life. I'm not gonna report on that today, but that's going to be used um, just to compare some of the menopause related specific questions at a later stage. So our response was over a thousand um, nurses and midwives, which is a terrific response. This is an area of which there is only limited research in, in, in Ireland. And I know uh, Loretta will talk more about her recent national study as well. And as we might expect, 99.3% um, of respondents were female. Um, and we've got a breakdown there in terms of registration. So we can see there's representations across um, all uh, registrations uh, with NMBI, the majority being registered general um, nurses, but that is a representation across the board. Um, and again, grades. Um, there was the senior enhanced nurse midwife for the highest number of respondents, but there's representation again, right across the grades from students, uh, right up to uh, director of uh, nursing and directors of midwifery um, as, as well. As we might expect, uh, looking at this wave diagram, um, that we can actually see that the majority of respondents, 84%, were in the 46 to 60 age category. So that gives us an idea that these responses are specific to, um, to respondents that um, menopause is an important and present issue for them. So it's not necessarily representative of all nurses and midwives, but those that have selected that this is an important issue. And we can see that 
in terms of the age categories, which reflect the sort of period of, um, of perimenopause. So just some other general demographic um, information. We can see that um, there's almost like a 50-50 split in terms of education level from level eight degree level to level nine um, postgraduate diploma up to master's degree. So reflecting the highly educated um, level of nurse and midwives in, in Ireland. Um, the majority were from the public sector, as we might expect, because that is the largest sector, but there is representation from the private sector. And any of our findings and our position statement cover both public and private sector members. Sorry, this keeps on moving on. Um, the area of work, we can see that's across all sectors, the majority, uh, or at least the highest numbers in care of the older person and medical surgical areas. There's an issue for all sectors of the health service. So just getting on to the midwife, uh, or the, sorry, the menopause specific questions. Um, and we asked the question, what describes, what best describes your menopause status? So this gives us an idea of where respondents are in terms of their current journey and experience. And we can see 46% um, moving towards half of the respondents are postmenopausal, um, with 35% uh, perimenopausal, um, and then we have lower percentages um, in terms of surgical menopause, um, early menopause, um, and we also have uh, prema uh, premature menopause as well. So there's a range in terms of experiences, the majority being postmenopausal or perimenopause. So we were interested in terms of preparation, in terms of um, how much education and information um, did respondents have about menopause? And these are the percentages um, again. Um, and we recognize as well that healthcare, as healthcare professionals, um, nurses might be in a position where they might have more knowledge, but we can still see high levels of uh, the reported that they had only a little or none at all. And that's quite a surprising finding, just underlines the importance of raising the profile of um, uh, menopause within the workplace. With um, a little reported again, 46% and none at all, 16%. So again, just to underline the importance of this issue, of raising this issue within the workplace. And we asked respondents, did they have menopausal sim symptoms? And again, we can see approaching nearly 90% of respondents um, uh, at, at the time the respondent did have menopausal um, symptoms. So the findings are reflected of that. And of those that they had symptoms, how would they describe them? So the majority were moderate um, symptoms, which is interesting of itself, but we can also see um, of um, huge concern is around um, those that reported severe and debilitating um, symptoms, approaching 20% of respondents. And it might well be that uh, Loretta might comment on that in terms of the general population figures later on. So we asked the question as well, do you, does your menopausal symptoms affect you when you're at work? Because this is really what the, um, what the study was about, what the survey was all about. To what degree do menopausal symptoms affect nurses and midwives at work? And we can see that 90% um, stated, yes, they did. Um, affect them while they were working. That underlines, highlights, um, you know, quite clearly that this is a workplace issue. Um, hands down, no questions about it. And when we asked, have you missed work because of your symptoms? Um, this was quite surprising because you would have thought such a high level would have led to, um, would have led to um, respondents missing work. But we can see overwhelmingly that women work through the symptoms. Um, and have to cope and deal with those symptoms in the workplace, with 83% um, not missing um, any work um, due to menopausal symptoms. Now, we were also interested in the workplace in terms of to what degree 
um, was their confidence in support in um, discussing menopause uh, with colleagues within the workplace and with managers. Um, we can see high levels in terms of, um, of those that are not very comfortable. So that's approaching 40%. Again, underlining that is a central issue in terms of making uh, workplaces menopause friendly where it, it is an environment where issues can be discussed. And when we ask the same question in terms of discussion with line managers or in, uh, uh, in terms of feeling confident, we can see that there's even higher uh, figures in terms of approaching 40% not confident, but the higher figures in terms of uh, only somewhat confident. So again, underline the importance of the role of the manager in the process of supporting uh, women in the world. And we asked the question, would you like to see your organization introduce menopause awareness training? Um, again, a key issue um, in terms of raising the profile of menopause. And again, overwhelmingly, we're approaching 90% again. Um, yes, there needs to be more uh, awareness uh, raising and also training for all staff in, in the health service. Um, in terms of a need for policy, and we've been arguing this um, for a number of years, is that there is a need to introduce policies. Increasingly, this has changed and there is greater understanding and raising a profile of the issue of menopause in the workplace, where we can see the respondents, again, approaching 90%, um, said there is a need for uh, menopause-related workplace policies. So I'm just coming to the, the end now, and one of the things I just wanted to highlight is that the IMO were one of the first um, organizations, trade unions and organizations generally, to raise the issue of the importance of menopause as a workplace issue. Um, we were ahead in terms of the um, Congress um, and also raising the issue with uh, the health service executive. In 2019, um, Phil made a statement as part of the menopause position statement that there are over 300,000 women working in Ireland between 45 and 64, and around 80% of those um, will experience symptoms leading up to menopause. And we would like to work, and this is the most position, we would like to work with employers to create positive employment policies, and as we do with other health and well-being related issues. Um, 2019, currently, there's an absence of policies. Um, these are not clearly evident, uh, particularly within the public sector in 2021. And the IMO believes that the profile of menopause in the workplace needs to be acknowledged, recognized as an important occupational issue and for resources to be invested in supporting women. That is our broad um, ask. This is what we want from the houses in a broad sense. And what we call for, um, and we recognise this is an issue for trade unions generally, is for wider trade, the wider trade union movement to embrace and campaign for greater recognition and support on this issue, and for healthcare employers in both the public and private sector to develop menopause-friendly workplaces that recognise the importance of menopause. And these should include the development of clear policies, training, um, and dedicated resources to support women experiencing menopause. So that's the symptom, just to say that this is only part of the journey in terms of raising the profile. We will continue to do this over the coming months and over the coming years to ensure that uh, menopause support is more readily available in the workplace. Now I'm going to hand over next to, um, to Loretta, um, Loretta's going to uh, tell us more about uh, menopause, um, particularly in, in the context of the work of the menopause um, hub, and also refer to the national study that was conducted by, um, by the menopause hub. Thanks a million, Steve, and um, thank you for inviting me on this. Um, and I'm, you know, delighted to be talking about menopause. Um, it's all I talk about at the moment, actually. Um, and, um, you know, I think um, women deserve better. Um, and if we compare menopause to puberty, um, we would never dream of not um, educating our children about puberty, educating ourselves about puberty, 
Um, it's covered in the school curriculum. We buy books and so on and so on. Whereas when it comes to menopause, um, we are not educated or um, we don't uh, make ourselves ready. And I think being forewarned is being forearmed. And I think education is the key to everything. So um, thank you for the invite. Um, I started working, as Steve said, back in 2019. I opened the Menopause Hub, which is Ireland's first dedicated menopause clinic in um, December 2018. Uh, my background is in um, the business sector, so in the corporate world where I worked in um, for major multinationals. So the move into, um, we would call it a medical and, and this kind of space in the world of menopause um, was born out of my own experience of going through menopause um, just a month before I turned 50. Um, my period stopped and the hot flushes started and they were the only two things I knew about menopause. So out of that, I set up the Menopause Hub, which is, I called it a hub so that I could add in services. And so we have a clinic with, um, you know, doctors, psychologists, um, dietitian and nutritionist, and um, a women's health physio and an acupuncturist. And we're an evidence-based clinic. But the other part of the business that I'm, I'm involved in is advocating um, for women um, and also driving the whole um, menopause in the workplace awareness. So um, Steve and I have been working together and myself and the, and the INMO over time. And yes, congratulations, because you were the first organization to come out in Ireland with your position paper on menopause in the workplace in 2019. Um, so for World Menopause Day, which is next Monday, the 18th of um, October, I commissioned some research myself as well. So in conjunction with this, the work that's been done by, by the INMO, I commissioned research at a national level amongst women. And what I'd like to do is to to share some of that data with you and um, to talk to you about what best practice looks like and to share with you some other organizations work on making their menopause, uh, making their workplaces menopause friendly. So that's what I'll do um, in, in the space for a few slides. Um, so if I just um, pull up this uh, chart um, Steve has covered some of the numbers that I'm covering. Um, so I'm sharing the screen, aren't I? Am I? Yes, you are. Yes, great. So um, I'm talking about menopause, the case for change. So one of the things is, you know, why is menopause at work relevant? And Steve has spoken about um, the Irish data there. But by 2030, there's going to be 1.1 billion menopausal women in the world. That would be actually 12 and a half percent of the global population. So it's a significant okay. number. Um, 50 percent of women will actually go through menopause. Sorry, 50 percent of the population will actually go through menopause. So everyone, every woman will experience um, menopause, whereas not every woman experiences childbirth um, or uh, pregnancy or um, fertility issues or whatever. So this is something that affects every woman. 47 million new menopausal women will come into this cohort every year. So you can see it's the sizable population of the globe. In the UK, the numbers are 14 million menopausal women and 4.4 million in the workplace. And like here, it's the fastest growing demograph, uh, demography or demographic. Um, and I suppose with the pension age um, getting older um, and people living longer, we're, um, women are staying longer um, in the workplace and in a sort of post-menopausal state. So, um, so we're spending, women are spending a third to a half of their lives in this post-menopausal state. So when people say I'm through the menopause, what they usually are referring to is they're through the worst of their symptoms. But once um, you become post-menopausal, i.e. 12 months after your last period, you're post-menopausal for the rest of your life. So Steve has also referenced some of this data, but the average age of menopause is 51. The average age of perimenopause is 45. And in the survey that I conducted, and I conducted a survey um, with over 1,100 women, um, in Ireland, 80% of this group were under the age of 55 and were, were filling out the survey um, about menopause in the workplace. So it's not an old woman's condition. Um, when I was going through menopause, started my menopause journey, I was um, a month before I turned 51. And I was, first of all, blindsided by it. But anyway, um, but I also um, thought it was affected women much older than me. But as you can see, and the numbers are, um, it's much, much more a midlife um, uh, condition. And there are more than 40 symptoms. The research that we conducted here, which is a thousand, um, uh, over a thousand, 1100 menopausal women, 90% have symptoms, 85% described describe them as moderate, describe them as moderate to severe, and 30% describe them as severe or debilitating. Now, Steve, they're very similar to the, the numbers of the, the INMO. 
um, data. And what I think is that, um, you know, there's a huge awareness has been built up, um, particularly in Ireland, but also in the UK in the last sort of six, 12 months. A lot of the um, top uh, sort of celebrities are coming out in the UK, Davina McCall, a program on TV. We had the Joe Duffy show in Ireland where he covered menopause and was dedicated to it for eight days. That has really lifted the lid and I think driven awareness around menopause. And a lot of women who were suffering with symptoms, who didn't know what the symptoms were, were kind of relieved to find out that um, they have menopausal symptoms. And I, um, I also think that when we put this survey out, a lot of menopausal women wanted to, who, have, who experienced symptoms wanted to respond to that um, to this survey because they wanted to um, to drive change. And these numbers that we have here are slightly higher than the numbers that were in the, the HSC piece that Steve referred to or numbers that we read about in average in the UK. But I also did some research uh, last year um, in advance of World Menopause Day. And what we found out about women in Ireland is 80 percent are unprepared for menopause. Now, I can vouch for that because I was completely unpre unprepared for menopause. 66 percent know little or nothing about menopause. I knew hot flushes and no periods. And I would consider that little compared to what we could know and the fact that there's over 40 symptoms. And about 50% of the population of the female population in menopause use Dr. Google, um, if you like, for um, helping them understand menopause. And that can be um, a very um, confusing place because the data is so conflicting, the, the sources are not always reliable. And personally, when I, I consulted Dr. Google, which I did, um, I actually found it almost paralyzing because I didn't know what to do, who to believe, who to trust. And um, so there's a big issue around um, trustworthy sources of information as well. This wouldn't have been so much an issue in the 1900s when the average age of menopause was 47. But actually, life expectancy for women, it was only 49. So you can see why it wasn't such a big issue. Today, the average age of menopause, as we said, is 51. And the average life expectancy for women in Ireland is 84 years. So we are going to be living about a third to a half our lives in this postmenopausal state. And what we want to do is we want to be living our best health, our best life um, in that, that time frame. And that includes in the workplace. So in terms of um, other results, we had just over 50 percent said that the performance was affected a little at work. Just over 30 percent said the performance was affected a lot at work. So there is an impact on performance. And personally, going through my symptoms, I can definitely say there was an impact on my performance. Standing up, making presentations, having mid hot flush, hair at the end of my head, the um, follicles were wet. I was embarrassed. I was thrown off track. If women have brain fog, if they have memory loss, insomnia, they haven't slept for nights, they have anxiety, their confidence is gone, so on and so on, performance will be impacted. Um, in terms of missing time off work, our numbers weren't quite as high as yours, but I don't think more, many of us has, have as difficult a job as you do, and particularly in the time of COVID, um, with all that PPE and so on. 39% um, of the women said they missed time off due to their symptoms, and 22% had missed three or more days. So that's a cost to the employer that perhaps if the employer was able to um, give some reasonable adjustments uh, to their staff, they may, um, they may avoid having to take this time off. And 86% didn't tell their employer the real reason for, for being off work. Now, in some places, obviously, you don't have to tell your employer at all why you're taking time off or why you're sick. But I guess the, the, um, the bit behind this is that they didn't feel confident in telling about their symptoms of menopause. And when I look at, you know, what are the implications for this? 43% in our study considered giving up work and 12% actually gave up work. And this is, um, if I compare this to UK data, their number is 10% giving up work. So that's a huge loss, once again, an impact on the workforce, a loss of talent, a loss of experience, a loss of training and development. In terms of discussing or having the ability or the confidence to discuss um, menopause in the workplace, 60% lack confidence in discussing menopause with their colleagues and 70% um, lacked confidence in discussing with their line manager. And then when they talked about training and policy change, our numbers are so similar to yours, it's unbelievable. An overwhelming desire for this to be talked about in the workplace and for there be to, to be training um, and awareness training for HR and management and for the development of a policy. So I think overwhelmingly there is a desire for, for change around this. 
if I look at what is best practice, um, so best practice is ultimately having a menopause policy, but a menopause policy has to have a number of facets and a number of elements to it. So best policy um, says, best um, practice says, start with a staff survey. So you've um, at the INMO done that staff survey, um, understanding what um, uh, the position of your members in terms of menopause, what they, how they feel, how confident they feel, um, how they it impacts their work and whether they want to um, give up work, but also what they want from um, their employer. So um, this is a very valuable place to start and you can actually measure and track performance over time. The second area is awareness training for staff. And if you think of those numbers, 80% of women are unprepared for menopause. Um, training for staff members who are going through menopause is actually critical um, because a lot of women have no clue what's actually happening to their body. And apart from the famous hot flushes and, you know, um, no periods and maybe insomnia, they know very little and they're unable to join the dots. And in some cases, their medical um, their healthcare provider can't join, join those dots for them either. So that's an element of, of awareness and training. The other area that um, has been cried out for this is training for managers and HR, how to have a sensitive conversation, how to support your colleague, what sort of reasonable adjustments can you give? What sort of reasonable adjustments does that person need? And how can you, um, you know, retain them in the organization um, and, um, you know, ensure they're valued and supported? The next area is um, is about um, reasonable. Oops, sorry, sorry, is about um, uh, menopause champions. So um, this is what what best practice looks like. Um, some organisations in the UK, in particular, have appointed menopause champions. So these are people, typically someone who's been through the menopause or is you know a family member of somebody going through the menopause so they can empathize and um, but they would also need training and what they would do is they would um, help drive uh, the awareness and training throughout the organization they would champion the cause but they would also help broker those difficult conversations between um, uh, a management a member of management and maybe um, an employee who just you know didn't feel confident about discussing this or can broker conversations on behalf of teams or whatever so menopause champions and um, appointing them is seen and I think there's a lot of um, similarities if you take mental health menopause like mental health was about 10 years ago and um, a lot of organizations have mental health policies in place and it's about taking some of the um, the structures and programs from that and saying how could we um, uh, apply this to menopause and it may be adjusting existing policy or looking at it through the lens of menopause um, that that needs to be done. And organizations may be doing this um, anyway, but it may not be um, uh, outspoken. It may not be vocally recognized as relating to menopause. And um, the area of reasonable adjustments and this, they can be simple things like um, a fan on your desk, an individual fan on your desk, can be access to cold water, it could be looking at the uniforms, is the material conducive to these women and um, do they um, do they have enough pieces of, of their for their uniform and um, is there an opportunity to take breaks to take bathroom breaks in case you know maybe incontinence is an issue or whatever so there are a number of reasonable adjustments and if you're working in an office based job the reasonable adjustments you might um you might need are one thing if you're working obviously in a hospital or in in, in wards then it's something else if you're working on a production line because i talked to other organizations it may be something else so that's why it's really important for the for the manager um, and hr to understand the needs of those cohorts of people and then obviously the last thing is the whole um eap so the employer assistant employee assistance program and it's about offering um support whether it's mental health support it's support to to medical um medical um practitioners to help with symptoms or whatever so if you take it all of that in the round and um, that's what a living menopause policy looks like. And we don't want a menopause policy that sits on a shelf, that's a tick box exercise. We want something that can be living within the culture of the organization. And in terms of my last slide, which is um, going to shift now any minute there, um, I'm looking at, you know, who, um, who has done this? And actually, you know, when I look at it, the INMO, obviously um, in uh, 2019, you, you were very, um, forward thinking uh, by introducing your menopause in the workplace position statement. The Royal College of Nursing has a similar um, menopause um, in the workplace guidelines. The NHS employers have one for all of their staff. The Metropolitan Police in the UK have introduced a menopause in the workplace policy. 
Vodafone have introduced a global um, piece of work around menopause and are putting menopause policies in place and support for staffs for staff and they're very progressive because they've been doing work around um, you know domestic violence and work and uh, you know support for for um, for those who experience domestic violence and um, in the workplace then uh, channel four they were one of the, the very first as well in the uk who come out with menopause um, in the workplace policy so it's becoming and the uk would be ahead of us um, in in all matters menopause but i think um, ireland is fast catching up and, and you know i'm doing webinars um, all of this week and next week to to raise a profile with employers and there has been a huge amount of interest. And I've just also, we did a piece of work with IBEC. So, um, and they've surveyed their employer members and um, their employer, the employers are recognizing that this is also becoming an issue and are planning to put in place programs to address it. And then Boots and MS, they also have um, policies and they're, you know, calling on brands to try and normalize menopause. So it's really exploding um, as a topic and an area. And I think we're, the last generation of women who will um uh who will you know put up with it anymore and in fact i think what we're saying is we're not putting up with it anymore we need um, to have this recognized we need to have it normalized so that's it in terms of what best practice could look like some organizations that are doing it um and um once again congratulations to the inmo i think you're doing terrific work in this area for your members that's me there you go so I hand back control to Steve. Yeah. There you go. That's great. Thank you, uh, uh, Loretta. I mean, one of the striking things, uh, the, these, both these surveys were carried out independent of each other, even though um, we, we collaborated with uh, the menopause hub, they were done completely separately. Mm. One of the re most remarkable things is the similarities of, of the findings, which just confirms, you know, the, uh, findings for both studies so it mm. validates them um I, so that that was one but when we shared our findings that we were uh, quite taken with mm. so i i suppose just for the final 20 minutes um could i just um, ask if anyone have any questions if could they put those questions into the chat function um and we will put them to um phil and loretta um, so we're just going to spend about 20 minutes just um, sort of having a discussion about menopause in, 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 in the workplace. So I just wanted to bring um, Phil in. I suppose one of the things that I suppose is, is at the heart of the issue is, is what workplace supports need to be put in place, particularly in the context of nurses and midwives experience of uh, menopause in the workplace. What, what type of things come to mind, Phil? Thanks, Steve, and uh, thanks, Loretta, and welcome, everybody. Um, I think this is a really important discussion, and it is interesting that our um, research and your research, Loretta, are similar, but I suppose we're, a, we're um, such a, a large female organisation that anything that affects uh, the larger population is going to, obviously, um, we're going to have a, a similar result in any event. I think the difference and the significant difference, and you mentioned it, Loretta, is the, the areas in which we work. So as, as nurses and midwives, um, the, the, the effect, the normal working day is just so difficult. Um, the, the length of the shift, yeah. uh, the fact that you rotate onto night duty, the fact that you have uh, rosters that have, um, you know, that span night and day, uh, there isn't necessarily a pattern to that. So your body doesn't adjust and then you know um, have a have a um, a rhythm that becomes normalised again. So when you combine all of that as your normal job uh, environment, very warm areas of work, um, some wards, for example, with no no natural ventilation, no windows, and now with overcrowding um, in most of our acute hospitals some really, really um, difficult situations where you actually don't have any space, where you're short staffed and uh, all of that. And then you add in um, the menopause and the symptoms of menopause. So it is our view that, you know, it's reassuring, first of all, that our survey shows that um, in the health service, you would expect that people would feel more comfortable talking about this because obviously it's, while it's not an, uh, an illness, it is a matter that that is um described in symptoms 
So um, we're used to that. We're all professionals and um, we're used to talking about symptom management. So um, I'm, I'm happy to see that the survey, our survey results are that people are comfortable, you know, talking about it, but at the same time, that figure could be a lot higher. And I suppose that would be the first ask of um, the health service, particularly the um, occupational health function and um, the HR function is to look at why, why is it that if it's ever going to be right and easy to discuss, it should be in this environment in the health service where we're used to having conversations um, about other people's symptoms and about managing other people's symptoms and advising other people. So why can't we do that for our own staff? So uh, I think that's important. I think I like your analogy, you know, where you talk about the um, puberty and conversations around that and how we would never leave that to chance. And I think um, that's a, a generational thing, obviously, but also there is a huge um, requirement on the employer to have the discussion about how it affects the workplace. And, you know, we, we have uh, surveyed our members recently about their intention to leave their job. And again, very, very, not surprisingly, um, very high figures. But if we know that some of this is caused by the the aging process, if you like, the um, menopause, and we know that that only affects women, well, then there is protection in the equality legislation. So I think there is, the, there is an ask here of the employer to look at it from the point of view of putting an equal playing field in place for women when they're at work to allow them to continue at work. Most of us um, at the age of 51 or 52 still have mortgages, have kids in college, have a lot of reasons why we must stay at work. Therefore, the employer must make the environment such that we can stay at work. And if, um, if our stats and your stats are right, well, then this is an area that requires attention and it requires it on the basis of gender. So uh, I think that for, for openers, Steve, those are some comments that I would make. I, I think one thing I will say, and I think we're, we're, we're getting better at this, I think traditionally we have been shy about talking about the menopause or when we do talk about it, we talk about it in a manner that is self-deprecating. And I think we need to stop that. I think we need to be our own champions. We need to talk about it seriously and we need to discuss it in a, in a very serious manner. Um, and uh, it isn't a matter that just simply um, should be dismissed. It is a serious issue. We've seen from our stats and also from, from the, the research you've conducted um, that it, it is an issue that is now affecting our ability to continue to work and enjoy work and enjoy life. Uh, one question I would have, Loretto, and I, I, I haven't asked you this before, but I wonder, um, and you're right, you know, the, the, the profiling and the issue raised by Joe Duffy shows, I suppose, that uh, there, is a, there is a lack of forums in which um, ordinary people can you know ha have discussions we know that on a lot of subjects but um it was interesting that the discussion continued for so long do you think there is a um a, a, um an, an over reliance on the discussion around fixing this with pharma pharmacological you know with 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 the, the pharmacological industry or is that um is that, um, you know, is there, is there a lot of discussion on alternative therapies? Do we have research on, you know, are they effective? Um, you know, have, have we, we haven't included that in our survey. It probably is something that we, we should include in, in, in future surveys, but I don't know if you have any information on that in your own research. Sorry, you're on, you're on mute. <laughs> When you were speaking, I didn't want to hear any any background noise to interfere. And um, yeah, I mean, we ask in our surveys, you know, how are you managing your symptoms of menopause? And, you know, there's a, a variety of, of different things from um, things like antidepressants, um, you know, yoga, meditation, et cetera, et cetera. And um, personally, I don't think um, that the pharma industry itself has been pushing anything. <coughs> I actually think it's about um, quality of life. And I think what is um, what what affects your quality of life may not affect mine um, and vice versa. So I think it's about what um, what a woman is uh, prepared to put up with in her life. And if her symptoms are such 
that anything that she has tried, whether it's, you know, diet and lifestyle, which is really important, whether it's um, alternative things like yoga, like herbs, like um, uh, homeopathy or any of those different alternatives. Um, and yet they, the symptoms are still not relieved and impacting on their lives. Well, then they do need to seek some other kind of help. Um, our clinic is um, evidence based. And therefore, we support um, uh, where there's evidence. And I guess the issue is, is that in a lot of areas, and, and we followed the British Menopause Society guidelines and the NICE guidelines, and um, they say that there's limited evidence available for some of these alternatives. They also say, you know, they do say that, and we have a page on our website about alternatives as well. So there's, you know, sage, um, black cohosh isn't available in Ireland anymore. There's Don Kai, there's over-the-counter solutions, there's phytosoya, as well as diet and lifestyle. Um, and there are um, some things that women can, can uh, take, but the level of evidence associated with it isn't very, is, there isn't very much. Um, and therefore, maybe at some point your hormones drop to such a level that they can't be controlled by that. So at the end of the day, it's it's um, for each woman to decide how their symptoms um, are being are best managed for them. And um, in my circumstance, I tried everything that was natural under the sun. And um, I make a joke about the well, I, I joke because it didn't work for me, but my magnets that I had to put in my underwear that cost me thirty five euros in boots. But I, I tried everything and diet, lifestyle, going to bed, you know, everything. And after three years, nothing had worked for me. And um, I was just, I was defeated. I was exhausted and I felt like a slow puncture. And it was only when I got hormone replacement therapy, which has had a really bad rap, unfortunately. Um, and the, the survey that was, or the, the research that was done in 20, 2002, the Women's Health Initiative, that research has been debunked now um, by the NICE um, and BMS, um, is that I started to feel back to my old self. So, you know, there is, you know, it is pharmaceutical, it is, man, it is you know, you have to have all the tests and all the, um, the research done and all the rest. But that, that's what I, that was my journey. But everybody's journey is different. But I don't think, I don't think the pharmacologi pharmacological um, uh, industry is really pushing and, and driving this um, personally. No, I think it's a quality of life of women and looking for um, solutions. And I think there's a lot more understanding um, at GP level and at um, women health centres in, in the UK. There's a lot more information oh, yeah. there about HRT and you know, having yes. the discussion and broaching the discussion, et cetera. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I think you're right. Uh, I think some people have um, concerns around um, broaching the subject, even with um, their medical practitioner. But I think we're getting better at that. Yes. Um, getting back, I suppose, to the, the workplace. Steve just um, notified me earlier that there's today there's an ad for... Um, a clinical nurse specialist in, yes. in in the area of menopause, which is really, really encouraging um, with one of the maternity services. But I mean, if we could if we could get that, for example, in occupational health departments within the health service, that would be fantastic. Um, so I, I think there's a there's a lot of, of really important and supportive uh, um, work that we as a trade union can do within Congress on behalf of um, women outside of the health service and within health service, but outside of nursing and midwifery, but we can also champion the specialism. So yes. um, the, the, uh, nurses are ideally placed and midwives are ideally placed to be the uh, the change agent, if you like, to, to lead the information and to um, advise, to look at um, clinics, to look at HRT, to look at alternative if, if 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 that suits better um but i think it's about choice and it's exactly as you say everybody everybody's experience is different so obviously everybody's treatment is going to need mm. to be different so um i think the um the the work we have to do there is still um a, I, I like what you say about the policy of course having a policy for the sake of having a policy. None of us want that. We've enough of those. Yes. Um, in fact, I think the next thing we'll need is a, is a, a, a carpenter full time to build shelves, to put all the, <laughs> the, the policies on in, in most locations. But I think from, from our perspective, from the women uh, that we represent in this age bracket going through these symptoms, um, it is right now, it's, it's the practical realization that this is real. 
that yeah. um, there is and there must be accommodation. It's not just, um, you know, a benevolent employer. There, there is legislation in, in Ireland around equal treatment while at work. And, and that must include um, treating women who have symptoms such as this uh, in, in a manner that respects that. And, you know, we have done great work as trade unions in respect of parental leave, paternity leave, carers leave, um, uh, many of the of the of the I suppose the basis for the for a lot of the, those legislative pieces have come from the European Union, but we're involved uh, at European level with the European Federation of Nurses. This is a, a discussion they're having right across the European states, but it is something that we must look at. That um, you know there, there there has to be reprieve at times, and and that's required until symptoms can um, be alleviated. And you know asking people to take sick leave for that probably in, in our view would would be um, singling out women to have a lesser uh, sick leave entitlement than men. So therefore um, we should have a consideration for specific leave to look at um, the menopause and to make sure that women are accommodated to, to stay at work as we said earlier because that is um, ultimately the aim. Absolutely. Um, and I, I would say just back to your point there, uh, Phil, about um, the role and the nurses, a uh, role of nurses and midwives is that, um, well, after the Joe Duffy show, actually, um, the uh, the issue was taken up by a number of politicians and a number of women's groups within the political parties. Um, and I've been approached um, by and I've had meetings with the Department of Health before that because they have um, uh, a women and girls health strategy and then they set up um, a women's health task force and they were looking for input. So I submit I made a submission um, on that along with many other people and we went to some workshops and we talked about it or whatever. And um, so um, and then came the Joe Duffy thing and that piled more pressure on the politicians. Um, and I know that as Stephen Donnelly has come out and said and he announced the first dedicated public menopause um, clinic to be in, in Hollis Street and or in the National Maternity Hospital. And that is where that that um, the the recruitment piece is um, for um, for nurses. So um, I think there's an amazing role for nurses because in a lot of org in a lot of um, on the ground, nurses are people that, be, you know, women would see for their smears, for their, you know, breast checks, for this, that and the other. And there would be an opportunity to be um, having that conversation and part of that um, education. And I also think in the UK, they're really driving the whole thing uh, within the, uh, the British Menopause Society. They're training for nurses and they have, you know, nurse prescriber programs and all of that for menopause. And I do actually think that there's a huge, um, a huge role. And I, I've said this before um, in discussions with um, the INMO. So I see that as a, as um, you know, a major piece, piece to play. Um, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, um, the generation after us will not will not have to experience menopause in the same way and the generation after that. Um, and we will not experience menopause the same way as our mothers. So it is all about, about a journey and it is about opening up the topic and the conversation. And I think it's about doing what's right um, uh, rather than kind of being seen to do the right thing. Um, so I think that's really, really, really important. And I think, Loretta, it's fair to say um, you you're to the fore of having this conversation in society mm. and you're to be congratulated on that because sometimes uh, these these um, conversations are uncomfortable so um, I think on behalf of the INMO we always find that you're a great partner in in this dialogue thank and you. in this conversation and uh, you're to be congratulated on, on, oh, on keeping this issue to the forefront and um, we're we're happy to do um, everything we can as a trade union representing a majority female workforce who, in our view, um, have a lot more to, to offer generally in, in the area of education around the menopause itself. And I think the CNS role and the advanced nurse practitioner yeah. role, absolutely. Yeah. Um, midwives, um, they advise women every day on um, women's health. So, uh, and our CNSs um, in the general service also in gynecological areas, in sexual health and well-being, exactly. um, I think the missing link here is we have to have an employer who will um, take this step with us yes. and invest in um, these specialists, not just for the general public, but also for their own workforce. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
Steve, I think our, our time is is up, but um that's right, yeah. We're and time. thank you and thank and thank Neve and um the team as well for uh, organizing this really good webinar. Thank you very much for having me as a guest. And uh five years ago I would never have dreamt of saying I was a menopausal woman because I would be terrified of embarrassing myself and everyone else. But uh I've obviously changed my position dramatically on that. Thank you very much, Loretta. Thank you. That's great. Can I just say, uh, Phil, just to re-emphasize that uh, um, we started this journey in 2019. We had hoped in 2020, 21 to continue on with this issue. So we're now picking this issue up because we do view it as uh, an important issue for our members and in broader society. So this is again the, the restart of uh, campaigning on, on this issue for the IMO. Any questions coming in? Um, I in the chat there before we finish. No, there was no questions. Just a thank you from Karen McGann. Excellent Speaking discussion. Thank you. And we'll make the recording uh, available to members who couldn't uh, attend because we usually get a much more of an up in terms of the recording. Super. Thanks a million. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very thank much. You.